today I'm just going to be giving you a little bit of a pictorial introduction to Renaissance theater. You've already read some stuff about it, you probably know some stuff about it, and I'm going to show you some pictures and tell you a little bit more about it. This is a picture of the reconstructed Globe Theater in London, which I actually got to visit in, oh gosh, it must have been around 2004 or 5. I can't even remember now. But anyway, I got to visit and take some pictures and actually see a show there, which you'll see more about later. But this is the famous outdoor theater that you've probably heard of that's associated with Shakespeare. And there's actually another reconstructed Globe Theater, those, the old Globe in Balboa Park, if you, if you ever have a lot of money and want to go see what it's like. But you can also kind of wander around there. It's really neat. It's a neat area. So um, here's another picture of the reconstructed Globe. This is the reconstructed Globe at night. Nah, ha, ha, ha. So in 1989, the remains of the Rose Theater, which is one of the first theaters in England, were discovered. And a lot of theaters were north of London, but most famously, some were south of London, south of the River Thames, which flows through London. And that was the, the ones that we know of as the Globe and um, the Swan, things like that. Um, so the reason that they had to be there is that theater was not not really a respectable thing. You had to be kind of outside of the city limits in order to practice it because it wasn't a super legal practice. It was seedy. It was next to bear baiting uh, places and dog fights and brothels and all of the sort of seedy elements of the world. This is a picture that comes from the Renaissance. It's pretty famous. You've probably seen it before of the, the Swan, the, the theater, the Swan. And it has a lot of the elements of the Shakespearean or Elizabethan theater. This is the proscenium stage that juts out into the center and that people could stand around and that they sat around. Behind the proscenium stage is, well, you have little doors that pe people could come in and out of, right? And people could watch from this area, but also behind here was called the tiring house where people could change clothes and change into their next costume. There was a balcony up above where balcony scenes would take place. And that area was called the heavens. Underneath, there would usually be a trap door and you could have like somebody rise up like a ghost from underneath. And that was called hell. Um, there's a flagpole because they would raise a flag on the days that they were actually going to have a show so that you could see it from across the river and decide whether or not you were going to cross the river and check it out. So that's, that shows you a number of the different areas. Also down here is where you would stand if you were a groundling, which is someone who paid a penny to get in. So pretty much anybody could come see it. But if you were more high class or more fancy, you could pay money and sit in these seats that went up the sides. And those were more expensive, but obviously more comfortable as well at the same time. I got to go visit the Globe Theater in London, the Reconstructed Globe, and I got to be to check out to see a play there. I got to see Anthony and Cleopatra, which is awesome. So in this picture, you can see at the very top of the screen in blue with the little crossings of wood, that would, that's the area that would be called the heavens and it's painted like the heavens. You can also see the balcony where folks would come out and you can see that there are little curtains where people go in and out like to enter and exit stage. Um, and you can also see that the, 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 sta the stage is surrounded by seats. So this was my view as a groundling. I was not able to purchase the other seats because they were sold out, so I had to be a groundling. And it's, you know, it's not the easiest to stand for three hours and watch a play, but it was really, really cool to see it. Before the show, as I mentioned, vendors would come around and they would sell nuts and drinks and things you could, other snacks and things you could eat. And at the, also at the beginning, actors would come out and dance sometimes. In this case, this guy's lighting the brazier there, which would be used as some of the theater lighting because they would have the plays in the late afternoon and the sun would go down. So by the end of the night, you were using sort of firelight. Uh, but otherwise, they didn't have lighting um, in addition to not having sets, but they did have really elaborate costumes. I wasn't allowed to take pictures during the actual performance, so I don't have pictures of the actors' costumes, uh, because I didn't want to get in trouble and take pictures when I was not allowed. This is a picture of the areas of seating that other people were able to get into, and I was not because they were sold out. So I would have paid for that, but I was unable to do so, so I stood for three hours. But it gave me a real good sense of how it must have felt like at the time to watch a play. Now we, we, we tend to do a little bit more of Shakespeare's plays, and they would go on for a little bit longer than they maybe did back then. So just as, you know, as a piece of trivia, I suppose. So the first Globe Theater is, you can see there in the picture, was built in 1599 and it burned down. 
shortly thereafter, looks like about 14 years later. So because Renaissance Theater didn't have sets, they instead they, they did a lot of costumes and they did a lot of special effects. And they would have magical illusions, they would have like mechanized things, and they would also have things like real live cannons. So during a performance, a real a cannon was used and it set the thatched roof on fire and burned down the original globe. The globe was rebuilt the same year um, and then demolished in 1644, which is unfortunate <laughs> that it was demolished, but it stayed up for a goodly while and made its owners a lot of money. Shakespeare was a very wealthy man by the time he was finished with his life. There is nothing left of the original Globe Theater, but you do have the plaque that says, Here stood the Globe Playhouse of Shakespeare, 1598 to 1613. So this was the original Globe Theater. And that's what's there, and this is on the wall of a pub. I wish I had been smart enough to get a picture of the pub with the plaque on it, but I, I, didn't, I wasn't that clever at the time. So here's the plaque, and that's all I got for you. Outdoor theaters were the more famous kind of renaissance theater but they also had indoor theaters and indoor theaters were set up in a lot of the same ways with a couple of exceptions they didn't have groundlings instead you can see benches the uh people who came to see the theater wasn't not as much a mixed audience as it was at the globe at the globe everybody came you had whores and peasants along with uh more wealthy folks Aristocrats, though, didn't go to the outdoor theaters. They reserved the, themselves for the more fancy indoor theaters. So the higher class of folk would go to the indoor theaters, and they were more expensive as well. And this is a, a depiction of the Blackfriars Theater or something that would have been like the Blackfriars Theater. So you can kind of see they had the same, very, very similar setup except modified for being indoors, so they had access to lighting. But otherwise, they, didn't use, they still didn't use sets or scenery or things like that. This picture shows you two different things. First, it shows you an example of Renaissance costuming. You can see the kinds of elaborate costumes that might have been worn on stage. But then it also shows you an example of how they would have been advertised. They're advertised on these big broadsides, these big pieces of essentially like the equivalent of, of cheap newsprint that they could stick up all over the, like post up all over to advertise the plays. So that shows you a little bit of both. So, you may have heard that during the Renaissance period, young boys were playing women's roles. So it was illegal for women to appear on stage because they, uh, the, part of the assumption was that a woman on stage was equivalent to a whore because she was obviously going to become a whore if she was displaying herself on stage. So they weren't allowed to be on stage. So instead, young boys played in drag all of the women's roles. So when you think about Romeo and Juliet, Romeo was probably played by a, a, a man, maybe a man who was no longer adolescent or just a little bit older than adolescent. Um, and Juliet would have played by a, a prepubescent boy whose voice hadn't dropped yet and who could still, who was still androgynous enough to be able to convincingly play a woman. And because of that, that affects the kinds of roles that women had. So it partially depended on whether Shakespeare had an appropriate actor. So during the time of Romeo and Juliet, there must have been a very, very capable young actor able to play Juliet. Likewise, Lady Macbeth, he must have had an older actor who was able to play that character as well or a younger but still, you know, an, a character who was up to that material. So at the times when you see, most of Shakespeare's plays don't include a lot of women, but at the times when you see really juicy women's roles in Shakespeare, those are times that probably coincided with when his theater company had access to actors who could pull that off. So part of it is, you know, sexism, but part of it was more practical, it was practical because of the legal reality of what it was like to um, try to do theater in England. Women did participate in court masks, which were elaborate dances that were performed by and for other aristocrats. Queen Anne was a big fan of uh, court masks. King Henry was a big fan. Um, and the other issue that would happen is that the theaters would be closed for plague a number of different times. And the theaters were also closed during the English Civil War by the Puritans who thought that they were terrible because they showed people doing horrible things. And also they were really concerned about the homoeroticism between these young boys in drag who were kissing and saying loving things to men. 
that bothered them. Although our recent scholars have argued that those relationships between the adult male actors and the young boy actors was intentionally homoerotic and probably homosexual, and the convention was designed to titillate male audience members. So, you know, there's, there's ideas about what that meant. Certainly, Shakespeare, you see, playing a lot with the idea of gender swapping. There'll be a, you know, a woman who decides to dress as a man. So then you have a young boy who is dressed as a woman who then is pretending to be a woman who's dressing as a man. Lots of room for, for gender play there. And we saw that Shakespeare's interested in that in, in the sonnet. So it's not unusual that we would see it in the plays, too. All right, so these next two pictures are examples of clown figures. So clown figures are like the figures that you see in Marlowe, like with Wagner and all of his various buddies. Those are probably clowns or fools is another term for it. And that was a, a really common on stage to be utilized as comic relief. And they would dress in silly outfits. They would play instruments. Sometimes they would have a dog. The Fool in King Lear, Falstaff in the Henry Cycles, or like I said, Wagner in Marlowe's Faustus. And this is a picture of one of the most famous Shakespearean actors, whose name is Richard Burbage, and he played major roles like Richard III and most likely Hamlet. So he, he, he and Shakespeare had one of those kinds of collaborations where they kind of work with each other and egg each other on. Kind of like Tim Burton and Johnny Depp before they it went sour, I guess. Um, but those things where you see a lot of people collaborating together and working with the same group of people, that's kind of how it was at the time as well. And it wasn't until 1660, during the Restoration after the Civil War, which you heard about in the previous PowerPoint, that women finally were legally able to act in public theaters. Okay, uh, that's uh, pretty much all I have to say about theater now. There's so much more information on Renaissance theater, and you can find it uh, everywhere. Check it out. Do a Google search and, uh, like, all kinds of info. There's so much Shakespeare. There's so much on Renaissance theater. Check it out. Enjoy it. Um, thanks for your time. This last slide shows the front page of what's become called now the first folio because it was the first time that anybody gathered together all of Shakespeare's collected works and published them all together at once. And you'll notice that it says Mr. William Shakespeare's comedies, histories, and tragedies. Those are the, inf the same three genres that we're going to be looking at in this class. There is a fourth genre called the romance, but as you can see here, that wasn't something that was called so at the time that was something that later developed so i actually kind of like to teach it without the romance even though those exist and i'll say more about that in class for now i just wanted you to see this picture of what the front piece of shakespeare's collected works looked like all right good luck on the quiz and don't forget to do your practice exercise